Guys, welcome to the podcast. This week is an absolute banger with a guy called Roger Woodall. He's the co-host of the Harry Redknapp podcast. He's podcasted with Piers Morgan, Harry Redknapp, Frank Lampard. He's also got his own podcast, The Eventful Entrepreneur. He's got his own course starting on teaching how to, people how to run events. And he's also the owner and founder of the Bournemouth Sevens Festival. He has over 30,000 people attending his festival and he shares his story about when he was 10 year old and right the way through his life to where he was now, being 10, selling tickets for the nightclub that was next door to where he lived. And he's just a proper entrepreneur. I hope you enjoy the episode. And as always, wherever you get your podcast from, like, leave a review, let us know if you enjoy it. It really means a lot. So here we are. He's Dodge. So, Dodge, welcome to the podcast. It's a pleasure to have you. Yeah, mate, looking forward to it. Good, good, good. So, for the listeners out there, I mean, I've followed you for a little bit of a while now on Clubhouse. I love your story. I class you as a proper entrepreneur, we'll say. That's the the new phrase that people people have termed it. Um, Just tell us where it all kind of began in business for yourself. Mm. Wow, where it all began. It all began, I, I grew up living above pubs in London. And when you grow up as a young kid, uh, downstairs in the pub, mum and dad, we had a flat above it and mum and dad would be running the pub. You're around a lot, a lot of characters, naughty characters, fun characters, they're just characters. And, and you're, you know, you, you become streetwise very, very quickly at a young age. Um, and I just saw opportunities. I saw lots of people around me making money. You know, there was, everyone was making money doing different deals or doing this or whatever. You and I, I kind of grew up in that environment. Um, and it all started really. There was a nightclub next door to our pub. You know, there was a there's a, there a thin wall from my bedroom to the nightclub. <laughs> and back back in the eighties, people would drink in pubs at seven o'clock till ten thirty, and then everyone would ship off to the nightclub. Yeah. Well, I saw a huge opportunity, and at the age of ten, where I saw, I'd go to the local nightclub next door speak to the manager in the in Saturday afternoon, buy 20 tickets off him for a pound. And at night time at 10 o'clock in dad's pub, I'd go around selling 20 tickets for two quid, but mine got them a huge jump. So it was a win-win for everyone. The nightclub manager was happy, he got his money. I was happy. I got my 20 pound for an hour's work and the customers were happy because they didn't have to, they could go up to the nightclub, not queue where there's 900 people, VIP straight in. So everyone was a winner. So it kind of started, back there, uh, back then. And um, also on Maybank holiday weekends at the pub, there was, it was on the River Thames and there was lots of walk by trade, loads and loads of walk by trade. And I would set up a stand on, on the bank holiday weekends where you'd have a hot dog stand and an ice cream stand. And depending on the weather, I'd go to the cash and carry, buy hundreds of hot dogs and out there selling for two, three quid a pop. Um, and that was a cracking earner. You know, at the age of 10, earning 600 quid on a weekend. It was... Where did that, did you see that in your younger days from your parents though? Where did, or has that always been in you? Have you seen that? Or was it just the characters in the pub? Where did that kind of come from at the yeah, age of 10? Yeah, well, it's a good, good question. Mum, my mum's a, a, a proper entrepreneur, old school entrepreneur, as we call it. And dad always was wheeling and dealing, earning money. And that was just what we grew up in. And, and I saw people earning money and I, and I wanted to earn money because I knew that money was going to bring, but being able to buy you stuff, you know, as a young kid. And it just kind of was from there. And I loved it. I love creating a win-win situation. I still do now. I love creating win-wins. I get a buzz of creating a win-win where the customer's happy and you're happy and everyone's winning. Everyone's happy. Yeah. So yeah, it started, it started 30 odd years ago, mate. Great. Great. And then kind of how did that evolve? Did you, um, obviously, you know, 10 year old, you, you're doing things and you're making, you're making some good money. And then how did that kind of evolve where you thought, right, I've got a proper business here. Yeah. Um, well, it went on from the age of 10, if you were, I, I had loads of businesses from 11 to 14 to 15 to 16. And I remember at school, I bought, you know, hundred Timberland hoodies um and at school I'd go to school and on Friday all the kids would get their pocket money at five o'clock and I'd be there 30 quid a pop bam everyone would get in these Timberland hoodies I'd go to the market buy them for a tenner and sell them for 30 quid you know you're doing a grand on a Friday as a kid you know so it's just it's just grown from there you know from the age of 15 16 17 and then I got into the into the nightclub promoting world 
um, and my mum always my mum always told me make sure you earn a pound a man and when I first went to the nightclub world I, I saw an opportunity there was a nightclub in, in in Loughborough in the Midlands and I went to Loughborough Sports University uh, where everything was just sport 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 and yeah. um, pound a man she said to me before I went there and the local nightclub had a thousand students in on a Wednesday and I went to the local nightclub said listen you're only charging two pounds to get in. Let's make it three pound. I get a pound. You still keep your money. I drive the trade there two hours earlier so people are drinking on your bars and I'll get more people there. And they agreed to it. So, yeah. you know, in your final year as a student, it was a guaranteed a grand a week. And I doubled the numbers from a thousand people to two thousand people and it was two grand a week. You know, and this is in 1999. Yeah, I, love I thought that. I hit the jackpot. It was just wild. And, and, and then it kind of grew from there. I ended up getting three nightclubs the following year. And then at peak, it grew to 12 nightclubs every single week in different cities all around the country. Yeah. You know, so I'd have three parties in a nightclub on a Monday, three on a Tuesday, three on a Wednesday, three on a Thursday. Um, and this is when the dot com, dot com started, the dot com boom in 2000. Um, I created a brand called popyourcherry.com. It was the, I, I took the logos from Pasha, you know, the cherry. Yeah, poker. yeah, the Pasha cherries. Yeah, 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 I got them, copied them, tweaked them a little bit. And that was, I created, created my brand. And um, I did that for 10 years um, and did through 1,500 parties across the UK and 40 different nightclubs and cities. And then, yeah, it kind of grew into what I'm doing now. Yeah, great. And then in terms of, I suppose you've evolved because where do you see the nightclub trade now or, or after the pandemic? Do you think where the nightclub trade is dead? Because there's a there's a guy who's developing a new nightclub in Sunderland. And I just think, would that be where I'm putting my money right now in terms of nightclubs? I'm not quite so sure. Uh, I was in that game for years and uh, I wouldn't put a penny into a nightclub right now. And even, and I'm an optimist, but I'm also a realist as well to understand that the nightclub world will come back. It's just a blip. It will come back. But I got out of the nightclub world in 2008 when we I came up with the idea of wanting to create a, a sport and music festival, which yeah. I've been running now for 13 years. So, no, I wouldn't put any money into nightclubs right now, um, especially with everything that's going on. But the nightclub world changed massively in 2007, and that's when I decided I wanted to get out of it because the smoking ban come in. And you'll probably remember. Yeah, yeah, I do. The nightclub, 2,000 people, everyone will be smoking. It was just the norm. And then the government said, right, no smoking in nightclubs. That had a, that had a big knock-on effect. And also the 24-hour licence had a big knock-on effect back then as well, whereby, like I said earlier, everyone would go to the bars. So if, uh, if I had a club in Birmingham or Manchester, you knew there was 15 bars with 2,000 people in. You knew yeah. when they come out of there, you want them to come into your nightclub. You know, back in 2008, they, put, uh, uh, they gave the licence 24 hours. So all these bars could stay open past 11 o'clock now. 12 yeah. o'clock, 1 o'clock, they put a little dance floor in the middle of their little bar and people would end up staying there rather than going into the nightclub. So all these things had a knock-on effect. I was glad I got out at the time that I did and I identified that it was going, it was just going downhill then. Yeah, it was because, you know, back in, back in when I was maybe 2003, I, I was a doorman. So I was a doorman in nightclubs and we would work in the pub, 10.30, we'd go across to the nightclub, we'd work there till 2, 2.30, yeah. 3 o'clock. And then that would be it. And then I seen the change where, you know, people weren't coming into the nightclub as early. People were turning out at 11 o'clock. The 24 hour trade came in and it just completely changed. And I think the way we now go out now, especially, you know, Newcastle and, and bigger cities like that, a lot of people are going out through the day. This daytime drinking's really took off in terms of that. So I do get your point everyone, on the nightclub. Everyone loves an all day. Huh? Everyone loves an all day. Everyone all-dayer. loves an all day. <laughs> it's funny though, the younger generation, I don't know what they're called these days, Z list, G list, Z list, X list, whatever they're <laughs> called. But the, the younger generation aren't used to, you know, when I tell them these stories, they're like, what do you mean you'd go out at 7 p.m. and get on the beers and then go to a nightclub? They just go, yeah. they leave their house at midnight and then go straight to a nightclub. Yeah. They didn't understand what pre drinks was. No, no, they don't. And, and God knows what the future will be like. God knows, um, God knows. I hope it comes back. I hope it goes full circle. I hope that earlier drinking because the, the, everyone wants community at the moment everyone wants to be around people everyone wants fun everyone wants music everyone wants to have a beer everyone wants to dance and hopefully we'll come full circle again but yeah a touch wood yeah. yeah i know i know so the festival scene kind of where did that idea begin where where did you think right i'm gonna 
create a, a massive festival, if you like, because it is a huge festival what you created as well. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's turned into a beast, 30,000 people. Um, but it wasn't in, day, in year one, it wasn't. And, and the festival scene 13 years ago isn't the same festival scene as it is today. 13, 15 years ago, there was probably 10, 15 festivals in the UK. Now there's a thousand to put it in perspective, you know? So I just saw a huge opportunity back then to mix my, knowing how to throw a really good party for 10 years in clubs, mixed in with my sporting connections. I thought, why don't we create a sport and music festival and make it different? Because I could see all these music festivals popping up, but there was nothing to make them different. And for me, it was about creating the experience. And, um, and I found a niche in the market. So yeah, that idea came about in 2008 and roll on 2021, fingers crossed it's going to happen this year. And just how difficult is it to plan, run and launch a festival for 30,000 people? What kind of man hours are you putting in throughout the year? Because it all, you know, a festival runs for a weekend, but how much planning goes into that weekend of yeah. in that festival? Yeah, yeah, a shitload. A real load, yeah. It's uh if I roll back 2008, it was 365 days, 16 hour days. Guaranteed oh. that I was whacking in, putting in, putting in the graft. Because you had to make it work. You gotta remember I launched it in the recession, yeah. the last recession in 2008. And I thought it was gonna cost a hundred grand to put on. I ran out of money six months prior to the festival because everyone wanted money up front, marquees, yeah. sounding companies, lighting companies, flooring companies, toilets, showers, fencing. I, all th I thought in my little world, my own mind little world that, yeah, 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 fine, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll pay after. Because I was the unknown and never had a festival under my belt, people wanted the money up front and that was in the January. So six months prior to the festival, all the money went out. I was like, oh my God. No banks were loaning money, nothing was, no one was doing anything. And the only option we had was to walk away from 100 Gs or gamble. And we took a gamble and the only option we had was to remortgage our house. Yeah. Um, which didn't go well down well with the missus, you can imagine. No. Um, and she was fully supportive and she's been an absolute rock for me all the way, all the whole journey. And she, you know, she's my partner in business as well. So. Yeah, huge gamble. But going back to your point, it was it was full on for four years, five years. And then when you finally break the back of it, that's when you can, that's when you're bringing people in full time to really help, you know. Yeah. And I think at, at what point when you were sitting on that fence of a hundred grand in and having to remortgage your house, how did, at what point did the doubts kick in into your mind and go, is this the right thing? Because putting your house on the line is a big thing. You know, you, you've everyone's worked hard to, for the bricks and mortar that they've got. And when you put that on the line, just how sure were you at that point? Did any doubts ever kick in? No. I was in. I was all in. Everyone out my way. I'm in. I'm in. Can the mortgage company lend us the extra money to put it on? It costs 300 grand in year one. So your house is on the line. You've got to remember that people back then, Dave, wouldn't, People wouldn't buy their tickets online because in yeah. 2008, you wouldn't put your credit card into, into a computer to buy a ticket. Everyone had the fear back then, you know, and there was no social media. So I was out flyering and postering all the yeah. cities and Twickenham and everywhere else I needed to be to make it work. And um, so, so, the, so the pressure, I, I can't explain the amount of pressure, but I love pressure. Yeah. I thrive on it, mate. I, I thrive on it. But you got to remember that when you open your curtains on the day of the festival, you open your curtains, you're praying for sunshine, and then you're praying people turn up. And at 9 a.m., when you've got your whole festival built, it takes two yeah. weeks to build the whole site, I'm waiting on the front door going, please, people, turn up. Please, people, turn up. You don't know whether they'll turn up or not. And then yeah. you saw thousands of people coming down. It was like, oh, my God, this is amazing. I don't know how many thousands of people are coming. I don't know how much they're going to spend on the bar. It was all the unknown because I didn't yeah. have a mentor. I had no mentor to go, I'm going to copy this business model because there was no mm -hmm. business model out there for what I was doing. I just knew that I was got four, I got um, in year one, 100 teams committed 
100 rugby teams and, and netball teams committed to come to the festival. Yeah. Then you're waiting for the whole party crowd to turn up. But it's all the unknown. And um, I love that connection. I heard that story where you, it was originally a rugby festival, wasn't it? That was the whole festival idea. And yeah. then you had the idea of inviting the netball, wasn't it? The netball I needed women there. I needed, I, in my mind, I was like, I don't want this to be a sausage fest. This, you know, I need, I need women at this festival. And to get women there, it's like, what other sport is there? We've got rugby sevens, which all these teams were buying into coming away for the weekend and, and touring with us and buying into the whole weekend of camping and glamping and all the stuff. I, went with it. I need women. How do I get women? Netball. Wow, all these netball teams started coming in. You know, and all of a sudden it was like, you know, it was, it was, a, it was, a, it was, a, it was a, yeah, it was just a match made in heaven. I wonder how many rugby players told their wives that, <laughs> oh, yeah, it's, there's a netball festival on at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> zero, mate, zero. And even to this day, Dave, it, that is funny because we've got 400 teams coming down now and the rugby squads of 30, 40 are coming down. None of them tell their missus is, 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 uh, there's thousands of netballers there that. as well, you know? <laughs> I love that. Yeah. I mean, I've been around rugby all my life and um, dipped in and out. And I've always been, you know, went on the tours and stuff like that. And I just think to myself, I can imagine all these rugby lads going off for a rugby <laughs> sevens tournament. I have a good weekend and the wives yeah. thinking it's just all men. <laughs> and the best excuse is the lads are like, to their wives, there was no mobile reception at this festival. There's no horns <laughs> put in a bag yeah, exactly. on the bus and left on the bus. <laughs> exactly. exactly, I love that. <laughs> and how important was because I uh, I listened to a podcast with Eddie Hearn actually, and he talked about his his father and talked about like flyer and and he didn't have social media, he wasn't able to put a post. How important was social media when it came along to your business? Mate, mate, a game changer. Mark Zuckerberg landed the biggest gift he could ever give to a promoter it was in 2008 when he landed Facebook on my lap. You got to remember that I've been flyering, and people don't know what flyering is. You you get you you print qu quarter of a million flyers, and you got to get each individual flyer to people's hands for them to take home to read. To then to type into a to a website, the chances are pretty low. Now now we know everyone just wants a simple click, but yeah. that's what we had to do. And I knew no different. But you know what? The marketing pre-social media was full on proper marketing. Now the marketing with with social media, everyone's a promoter. Everyone's a promoter these days. Everyone's an entrepreneur. They're pressing buttons, but while they're laying in bed, and it's great. But I'm glad I experienced ten years of the proper graft. And now 10 years of the proper social media graph, which is more mental than physical. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's played a huge part in our, in our festival and it's played a huge part in everything that we do. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you know, last year was, was cancelled because of the pandemic. And what were your thoughts when you started seeing the pandemic come across from, from China, you know, which we all thought it was never going to come here. And then we thought, hang on a minute, it's, it's coming. And then, yeah. It was it was weird, Dave. It was um, it was March the twenty third, two thousand and twenty, and Boris came on the TV BBC and was all serious and saying we've got a pandemic on our way, and he had this. I always remember this graph that he's shown, and the pandemic was the May Bank Holiday weekend, which was our weekend. You got to remember that we've worked, we worked, we would have worked i've worked four thousand days on my baby and that's the festival four thousand days you know in the mind tweaking improving and getting it up to thirty thousand people and creating a festival that people know worldwide now and then for two months prior to your festival your 13th festival for him to say the words he said and then for us to go shit what are we going to do we had to think quickly on our feet and we we spoke to the police the council the licensing spoke to the venue and within about seven or eight days, we turned it all around and we moved the date to the August bank holiday weekend. And then we moved the date, you're then got to tell all the 30,000 customers we've moved the date. Um, so we did that and our customers stuck with us, um, which was an amazing feeling. 
an amazing feeling. And then it gave us a it gave us a lifeline, Dave. It gave us an extra hundred days to go. You know what? This could happen. And then when we got to about June or July, it was all the festivals were going. Glastonbury's, your Reading, your Leeds, your big powerhouse ones, and da da da. All of a sudden, we had to make that step and 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 announce it to the UK public that we had to cancel the festival, and that that was heartbreaking, mate. I have to say, I'm not yeah. sit, I wasn't sitting there crying my eyes out. It was just reality of like, wow, that's a big loss. It's a mm -hmm. big financial loss. Yeah. Um, due to this thing called COVID, corona, pandemic, pandemic pivot. I've been learning all these words, but we dealt with it. You know, I'm, 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 I'm good when I'm, my back's against the wall. And I'm very good. I did the same in 2008, back against the wall. Doing the same in this recession, back against the wall. And it's allowed me to create new businesses. Um, so... And what did you do? What what did you do? Because I am um, I'm exactly the same. I say, if you give me, if you tell me a problem's coming up in three months' time, I'm terrible at that because it's like it wears on your mind and it's it goes through and you dip in and out. If you say there's a problem here and it's 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 happening tomorrow, I'm great with ideas on how to pivot, change whatever we need to do to to get out of this. At what point did you sit down and think? this business model I've created and I've worked 4,000 days on has been taken away with one television episode, if you like, from the Prime Minister. At what point did you start thinking, what else can I do apart from festivals? That night. Did you? That night, 100%. 100%. As soon as Boris spoke, I was on the computer going, shit, I need to think of a new business. I need to think of something new and fresh because all my, all my eggs are in this basket. You know, when that bus, when that gets taken away from you, it's like, I've still got 10 full-time staff to feed. I've still got a, a, a family to look after. I've still got all these things to do. And, you know, I'm not going to get any of that money back. And I'm not sitting there crying. It's like, right, I've got to think now. What am I going to do? What can I create on top? So I must have been on YouTube and Google 18 hours a day for 30 days. Just typing in new business. What can I do? Da, 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 and how da. dangerous is that, by the way? How many how many rabbit holes do you end up going down if, you, if you Google and that? On Lo it? Loads. But you know what? Back was against the wall. I didn't care. I did not care. It was about how I can create a new business. And the new business is what I've been working on now for the last eight months. And we finally found it. I was like, online course. An online course for events. I knew what was coming. I knew that the universities are gonna go, Zroom. I knew that. I knew the universities haven't kept up to date. I knew that car companies keep improving. I knew that gyms keep improving. I knew that everything, but the education system was never improving. The education system, what they were doing was, was charging the kid, the students, more and more each year. I knew that the students were being charged 27,000 pounds to do a three year degree in event management. And I knew there was a myth out there that you had to do an event management degree to get into the sexiest, coolest industry in the world. And that's the events industry. And that's when I, that's when I saw my opportunity. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. And that opportunity was to create an online course, an events course, which got them, the students, a diploma and certificates. And I'm bringing in 40 of the leading industry experts in events so our HQ to be filmed to do an hour's TED talk about what what their specific uh, skill set in the industry that we can teach the students. Yeah. At a fraction of the time and at a fraction of the price. So they can do it in three months. And instead of paying £27,000 and leaving university in debt of £50,000, they can do our course for £2,000. Yeah, And they're learning from the industry experts rather than a lecturer reading from a book, teaching them from a book that was 20 years ago. Yeah, it's I, I, absolutely. My, my business is in education. We work with colleges, training providers. We've worked with universities and we know and understand. I believe the universities will be very, very worried. The levies came out. 
There's some big money with some big employees right now who can spend their own money. Why would you go pay nine, 10,000 pounds for this year, sit at home and do it like we're doing this podcast today with no experience. You're not going out, you're not meeting people. And to sit there to come out with a load of debt where you can go and work in the business, do a degree apprenticeship, do a higher level apprenticeship or some form of program, fast track it and be where you need to be quicker than any other person. It's nailed on the head, mate. There's no one I don't know in the events industry. Once they've done our course and got that diploma certificate, that will get put under the noses of the right people in the events industry. They're fast tracking and they're saving themselves 50 grand's worth of debt, saving themselves three years. But don't get me wrong, university's great for meeting people, great for partying, great for playing sport, great for having a laugh, and great for growing up from an 18-year-old young adult to a 21-year-old. You're going to learn a lot of life skills there, don't get me wrong. But you're also being led down a horrible garden path that you're going to be at 50,000 pounds worth of debt around your neck for the next 20, 30 years. I'm in my 40s. I've got mates of mine who are still paying their student loans off. Yeah. What a terrible way to start your life knowing you're going to be in all that debt. So we're solving a huge problem here and we're genuinely, genuinely excited uh, and we're going to create, an, well, we are creating, it's going to be launched in April this year, a course that's going to solve a huge problem and, and, and going to give something that... Is it accredited with anybody as well? Yes, your, your accredited program? with CIM, Chartered Institute of Marketing, which allows us to go yeah. global as well. Yeah, yeah, fantastic, fantastic. And and to be honest, it, it would be a good program to put to 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 events businesses as well for Great. their own staff and stuff like that, because I think there's a massive market for you there. Well, if you if you of... if you want to do events and you want to learn how to create a brand, you want to learn how to plan an event you want to learn how to do this uh, the marketing and the digital marketing you want to learn how to sell an event you want to learn how to put an event on we're giving you a business in a box here learning yeah, in talk brilliant. from the best you know and on top of that you're going to be learning entrepreneurship and leadership um so it's just encapsulating everything that you need to know really not just for events but just for that skill set of, of of life you know mm -hmm. whatever industry you're going into you know and I think, where do you see the events business going after this? Because I think we're, a, we're on a bit of an elastic band and we're being stretched. And as soon as that man on the telly says, right, folks, you can go out and play, everyone will be wanting to book something. <laughs> Mate, everyone's going to go mental, I think. I genuinely do think that. I think the, uh, the 60, I can't really say about 60, say the 18 to 25-year-old are normally partying the hardest, you know, at festivals, at nightclubs. Um, and just genuinely partying. They're going to be chomping. The 30 to 40 to 50 year olds who maybe have got five or six big nights on them in them a year, they're going to double that to 12 big nights. Or a yeah. couple, instead of doing one festival, they might do two or three. Or, you know, or instead of going to Ibiza once every two years, they go to Ibiza every year. Or that people are just be doubling up going, let's make the yeah. most of it because it might come back. It is true, and I will put it on record just for my wife if she watches this, because I did say last year's a beta trip with the lads. It doesn't get cancelled, it just gets rolled over, so rolled we have over. two a year. <laughs> <laughs> That's the key to a happy marriage, mate, is making sure you get lots of lads' holidays in. It is. See? No that. That. That's going to be my promotional <laughs> clip for this podcast. <laughs> can't beat a good lads holiday for sure you can't you can't and i do think people will crave that have you got any ambitions to take the events even further when it when it starts again obviously the first big thing is get your the the, the main event back on have you got any ambition to take that even further and run abroad and and further on no no i'm a, I'm a lifestyle entrepreneur dave um and i really like it that way you know the festival site is 10 minutes away our offices are five minutes away. Why would I want to be thinking about, you know, I, I, don't get me wrong, in my 30s, there was probably 19 different festivals I wanted to create. I had Miami sports festival I was looking at. I was looking at Cardiff Sevens, I was looking at things in London, I was looking at things up north. And and, it, and for me in business, things have got to tick eight of the 10 boxes for me to think, am I putting half a bar into this risk? You mm -hmm. know, half a million quid or a million quid, whatever it may be, under grand or whatever it may be. I need to know eight of the 10 boxes are being ticked before I move forward. Um, yeah. But I, 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 I like concentrating and being an expert of the Bournemouth Sevens Festival and tweaking and improving and adding new dance tents and new headliners and new 
entertainment and, and just knew everything. That's my baby. So why, do, why don't just focus on this, tweak loads of things and make this amazing. And that's what we've done for the last 13 years. Love that. I love that. Cause again, it's, it's very dangerous being an entrepreneur, your mind can take over. And before you know oh, yeah. it, you, you, you take, you, you're taking on 19 events. Do you know what I mean? And I think that's important message there of just tweaking the one you've got and, and being that lifestyle entrepreneur, which I like, cause you, you need to, you need to balance the two, don't you? hundred percent. I've just come off a, a clubhouse chat, but a, a mate of mine, um, and he's an empire on, entrepreneur. And that's miles away from my mind, you know, buying up big housing estates, buying up this, buying up fun fairs, buying up zoos, buying up that. That works for him because that's his buzz. My buzz isn't that. My buzz is the lifestyle, knowing that I can focus on three days of the year and enjoy lots of other days, holidaying and being with the family and doing nice stuff. Well, you know, that's just my, my take yeah. on it. And I don't want 20, 30, 50, 100, 300, 500 staff, 10 staff. It's a boutique, nice, that's the, that's the perfect number of staff that is, 10 yeah. full-time staff. For me, everyone's different. Everyone's no, different. To, but, to be, hon to be yeah. honest, Dodger, I, I completely agree because uh, a fair few years ago, I grew a business, we had 100 staff. When we had 10, 15 staff, I loved yeah. that business. I loved going to work. When I had a hundred staff yeah. and we turned over stupid millions, yeah. I hated it. I yeah. didn't, I, I, I had a job. It yeah. wasn't a business. It wasn't a lifestyle. It, it became yeah. a beast and whatever we had to do, we had to keep feeding this beast. Yeah. And I always say now to anyone I mentor, to anyone I speak to, just keep it small. Don't, yeah. you don't need the big ambition. Uh, yeah. Fair enough. You're right. Everyone's different. If someone wants to go for the billions, yeah. who am I to say no, but Keep yeah. it small and niche and 100%. enjoy what you do. 100%. The thing is, when it goes over more than 12 or 13 staff, you'll start finding hierarchy comes in place. Gossip comes in place. Yeah. Someone's sleeping with someone else and someone da, 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 and your office gets gets spread apart. And then you've got to start looking at, start looking, bringing an HR person in. Then the person who you grew the business with and you had the fun of marketing and selling and, and writing on whiteboards, old school, da, da, that all gets taken away from you. It does. You know, and I don't want to be anywhere near that. And um, yeah, I've always been a lifestyle entrepreneur, mate. And I would, I would recommend it to anyone of trying to keep it small and just up the profits, reduce everything, and just keep it nice and tight. I love that. I love that. I know you're the eventful entrepreneur, but I, I love the lifestyle entrepreneur as well because I think yeah. that could teach so many people so many good yeah. lessons on that. Um, so where did the podcast come from? Because you know the the co-host of the Harry Redknapp podcast. You've obviously got your own podcast. Where did that kind of idea come from? It was um, after Boris spoke. <laughs> Everything's <laughs> all about Boris these days, isn't it? Um, when I was coming up with the idea of, of creating the uh, events course, I had to think of the business model and the marketing tools behind it and how you would create yourself as a key person of influence in that, in that events world. And I've kept myself private for all my life. And my staff were like, you've got to go public. You've got to get an Instagram account. You've got to, you've got to tell your story. Because I never told anyone the story. So I thought, okay, why don't we do a podcast? I didn't know what podcasts were until three, four months ago, whatever. Let's do a podcast. Let's give it a go. So we gave it a go. And, and I told my story and put it out there. And people loved it. And it just gave me the confidence to go, wow, get an amazing feedback here. Why don't we do another one? And then we kind of called it the eventful entrepreneur which is i didn't want to brand myself people are talking about this personal branding i didn't want to brand myself under my own name i, I it felt it just didn't feel comfortable mm -hmm. so i was happy to have that eventful entrepreneur i'm happy to be the eventful entrepreneur you know so that was why we created the podcast and i'm well connected so i've got some really cool people on the show who are faces in the sporting world or 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 entrepreneurs or own festivals or whatever it may be, but proper people, you know, I only want to, yeah. I only want to be in conversations like this where I'm chatting to proper people like yourself and, and saying it how it is. You know, one of my favorite people, one of my favorite people, favorite stories. And I love hearing him talk is Tony Truman. Yeah. I just, I just think he's got a, again, very similar, isn't it? In very terms similar. of a good mate of mine, true. He, he's done six, he's been hugely successful in the last seven or eight years in, in Ibiza with the Ocean Beach Club now, the O Beach Club, 
we've got this very similar backgrounds. And when we were actually, when I did the podcast with True, we could have been there three hours. We're like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> it was great. But um, my favorite one out of my own personal podcast uh, of the Eventful Entrepreneur podcast, it's got to be, in fact, I've got a few, but Barry Hearn. Yeah. He's the king of events, king of sport, king of sky sport. And he's 70 odd and he's so sharp, straight talking, clued up. And obviously Harry Redknapp, again, in his 70s, says it how it is, got lovely stories, sharp, clued up. Um, yeah, I've, I've enjoyed all my all my episodes, honestly, because I only pick people I want to chat to and have an yeah. hour's chat with someone who I actually genuinely want to have a chat with because then your passion shines through. It does, it does. So, yeah, so, um, yeah, so that's been going now for 20 episodes, or so 20 weeks. And about four weeks ago or whenever it was, I got a phone call from a London production company saying that uh, on my mobile on a private number. Hi, oh, is that Dodge? I was like, yeah, my name's da 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 da. I'm the producer for I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. Can I come and see you? I was like, yeah, mate, of course you can. Come drive down, boom, if I come, come and see us, I'll, we'd put a little studio and whatever. He said, I love the podcast. Would you like to be a co host of this new show called The Harry Redknapp Show? I was like, of course. I mean, I mean, where do I sign, you know? So, <laughs> so, um, so that, that will all happen so quickly. Um, and me and Harry, next day, it was me, Harry and Frank Lampard. And then um, last week, it was me, Harry. We, me and Harry have had such a laugh. He's yeah. a good mate of mine. He's proper good fun. Got so many stories. And in these times, mate, there's not a better person to have Harry beside you just telling stories and yeah. making you belly laugh and stuff, you know? Them them kind of people are a thing of the past, I think. Yeah. The 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 storytellers. There's not many modern day storytellers. Like, you know, we always talk about like we love a sportsman's dinner, whether it's whether it's Paul Merson, Doddy Weir, yeah. whoever it is. We love going and hearing all the old stories. Yeah. You never hear that from the generation of today. Do you know what yeah. I mean? It's yeah. I think people are afraid. To tell the yeah, stories they're where afraid. they're all the generation just off the cuff and they've just got so many. I agree, it's mate. Great. Totally agree. And I always said, as I, as I, as my, as I'm getting older, I said I'd never be that person to say it was never as good as it was back in our day, because I used to hear that from older generation. I think, oh yeah, yeah wind your neck in. But actually, I'm starting to think it now. It was we had it. It was not so much more fun when we were doing it back in the day, because we would say how it was. Yeah, I mean, I still do. So hopefully, I can keep that. I can I can pass well, keep the bat on from the the good stories from. And you need to do that because I think nowadays it's like someone's just got a camera in your face. Someone's got a, a record. I see it my kids all the time. I say you've got to be so careful because there's always someone there taking a photograph, recording. I went, don't send anything yeah. if you don't want the rest of the world to see what you're sending. Yeah, I, agree. I say, and that is the fact. Where I remember you used to be running across a field, and I used to hear me dad shouting, as thinking, I know it's you, David. I know it's you, and yeah. you. But no, no one would ever grass you up. You had Absolutely. to be seen. Now yeah. it's on Instagram bloody live for the kids yeah. are doing up to no good. And yeah. it's I remember I remember as a kid growing up, someone would say something, and my my answer would be prove it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I can prove it. <laughs> now everything's recorded and whatever you so yeah. See, I was the unlucky one. My dad was a mechanic. He had a, a garage in a local village. And so everyone went to my dad's garage to get the car fixed. So he'd always come in and say, what were you doing the other night? Yeah, and I go, yeah. how do you know? I go, ah, I know everything. I, yeah, I've yeah, got yeah. eyes all over, and I'm yeah, just like, oh, yeah. shit. I was the same, mate. Growing up in pubs, growing up yeah. with Dorman, and the Dorman would be taking me to nightclubs to three, four in the morning as a 10, 11 year old. <laughs> Everyone would be clocking, oh, that's, that's, that's uh, the landlord's son. What's he doing here? So you couldn't get away with. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Good though. And so, what's kind of the, what's the, where's the future life for yourself? Is obviously the, the big festival coming up. Yep. Fingers crossed for you. Yeah, um, and then the, the new course. When does the new course roll out? When that's going to start? We want the events industry to get back on its feet before we launch the course. We're looking yeah. at probably April. Um, really excited by this. Is I don't want to say too much about. I'm just super excited because I know we've got something that could be a game changer, um, and it's something I'm super passionate about. I'm going to carry on doing my podcast because people really like that. And the only way to judge your podcast is by looking at the written reviews on Apple. Yeah. You know, you go and read the written reviews. I don't know who people have written, but they, everyone's writing all these amazing reviews. It just gives me that confidence of going, keep yeah. going, Dodge. Keep going. And 
I'm having proper fun with the Harry Redknapp uh, show as well. So I'm just. I mean, at what point did did you ever think, like you know, sitting there twelve months ago in a completely different life, and then you're on a podcast with Harry Redknapp and Piers Morgan and think, <laughs> what am I <laughs> no, doing here? Mate. No, mate. I was listen. I, I, if the festival would have happened right now, like now uh, last year, I wouldn't have thought about an events course. I wouldn't yeah. have thought about. Harry read that podcast. I want to do my own podcast. I wouldn't have thought about creating a personal brand for myself. I wouldn't have gone public. I wouldn't be on Instagram. All these things have happened because of COVID. So yeah, I'm a proper optimist, and I know so much is good has come out of it. Okay, we lost the festival last year. We had to cancel. We lost a lot of money, but that'll come back again. Yeah, you know, I'm everything happens for a reason, doesn't come it? Come back again, and and it's also given me a wonderful lease of life as well because I'm Love doing that. new stuff. I'm getting comfortable with being uncomfortable, you know, and I that's that. a big thing for me. My last question I ask all of my guests this, and it's I'm always interested to see is, um, what are you doing now that your future self will thank you for? The events course and speaking up on podcasts. Love it. Love speaking it. up on podcasts and telling my story because there's too many people out there at the moment who think there's some magical wand with business and there's too many people out there speaking with so much jargon that it's not needed keep business simple yeah. make sure the turnover is a lot higher than what you're spending simple yeah. make sure your profits are tweaked that you can keep playing around with your profits simple don't overcomplicate it yeah everything else is getting overcomplicated by should I use Twitter? Should I use Instagram? Should I use Clubhouse? Should I use LinkedIn? Da, 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 da. Just focus on your business and just pick one or two of them and become an expert in your field. And once yeah. you become an expert in your field, everyone will know who you are and what you're doing. There was an interesting one the other day, and it is about keeping business simple. Some woman was saying, um, I think I need a click funnel for me business. And I just piped up and said, I've never, ever had a click funnel. I'm not saying you don't, but I'm just saying I've managed to survive in all of these years in business without a click funnel and I yeah. still managed to sell and turn over and make That's a profit. Perfect. So I think yeah. you're right. There's all these things, all this stuff floating about, all this jargon. Just keep it simple. That's keep great it advice. simple. Life is so nice when it's kept simple. Great. Well, Dodge, I've absolutely loved today. Uh, I've enjoyed it, Dave. Podcast. Really enjoyed Cheers, it, mate. mate.